So without further ado, join me in welcoming IJ. We have audio? Not for me, for the video. We have the world of the Internet of Things. The Internet of the Things. Internet of Things. What does what? it mean? The Internet of Things is changing the much Internet of the world. Things. Because the Internet of Things will transform the way we do business, helping people everywhere live healthier, safer, and more productive lives. Chrysler has ordered a recall of over a million trucks and cars after hackers were able to take control of a Jeep over the internet. Like many thousands of Jeeps around the world, it can be remotely hacked over the internet through a cellular connection to its entertainment system that would allow someone to take over its steering, its transmission, and even its brakes. Shocking new revelations from former Vice President Dick Cheney, admitting that he feared his heart problems could cost him his life, but not in the way you think. Find out just how easy it can be for hackers to take over the stoplights on your commute. A major security vulnerability affecting several white label security cameras, which allows us to get the password to the camera no matter how complex it is. People can now use computers from faraway systems to attack your Internet of Things devices, the locks on your doors, your HVAC and air conditioning system. You can do all sorts of really scary things in this new world. So as the video reflects, and as will come as a surprise to precisely no one in this room, IoT is going through a very rapid era of change. And like it or not, and realize it or not, one of the biggest changes that's right around the corner is that there's about to be an explosion in litigation and enforcement activity when it comes to IoT hacks and vulnerabilities. My name is IJ Polanski, and I am not a cybersecurity expert which means that it's a little bit odd for me to find myself here at Black Hat. And in fact, when I found out that Black Hat accepted my proposal to talk, I was stunned uh, pleasantly, which was very quickly replaced by a severe uh, anxiety that nobody would actually be interested in what I have to say. But looking out over a pretty full room, um, now I've got a new concern, which is that I don't totally screw this thing up. But luckily for me, and hopefully luckily for you, I have some relevant and even unique experience with respect to IoT litigation. So I'm a trial lawyer, and you probably already knew that because I'm the guy at Black Hat with the suit. I focus on complex commercial litigation, some consumer class actions as well. I mostly represent defendants, but a particular relevance to this audience, I'm the lead lawyer in the federal class action lawsuit that followed from the GPAC work that Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek did and presented here at Black Hat in 2015 and 2016. And for those of you who didn't know, just a few weeks ago, the federal court certified a class of about 220,000 of those vehicles, which means that we can proceed in one case for all of the owners and all of the people who leased all of those 220,000 cars and trucks. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. Before any go, I go any further, I should probably explain this sort of weird comic booky thing. I couldn't resist given the audience and the fact that we're in Vegas. That's actually me from an article in Wired Magazine uh, that they decided to do as a comic book about when I played the world's best AI poker computer in an exhibition down the street at the World Series of Poker about 10 years ago. So after the talk, if anybody wants a poker game, we'll all head over to Bellagio. All right. So what do I want to accomplish here today? I actually have some pretty ambitious goals. I want to change the way the people in the IoT space seem to be thinking. And ultimately, where I want to get to is to provide some fairly concrete suggestions about what you and your organizations can do to minimize the risk that comes from the litigation that we're discussing. But it's going to take a few steps to get there. And the place to start is by observing a distinction between data breach matters, cases, lawsuits, and IoT vulnerability hack lawsuits. 
and the difference is important for a couple of reasons. But first of all, let's describe it. Data breach disputes are relatively straightforward. You're all probably familiar with them. It's when a computer network gets exploited and data gets stolen. IoT hacks and IoT vulnerability based disputes and litigation, litigation are different. First of all, a pretty different set of rules applies. The rules that apply to data breach do not generalize to cases about IoT. And relatedly, there have been a fair number of lawsuits about data breach. They've worked their way up through the courts and there's some precedent. There's a track record there. And the same just isn't true when it comes to IoT litigation. There's very, very little. Probably the case that's gone the furthest and the biggest case is my team's GPAC case. And that's got some important implications with respect to uncertainty, risk, and questions about how long-standing rules are going to apply. So ultimately what I want to do is I want to convince the people in the audience here today that they've been radically underestimating the risk and the cost associated with what I believe is an inevitable wave of IoT-based litigation that's right around the corner. Conditions have changed and are changing. We're reaching an inflection point where what's, what plaintiff's lawyers and the plaintiff's bar have been talking about for years is about to happen. And that is, all of the conditions are going to be right for a wave of these lawsuits. Where do we start? I think the place to start is actually with the discussion of policy. And the reason is, we're talking about claims. We're going to define what claims are in a little while. The rules of the road when it comes to these lawsuits that have been around for 200 years. The rules aren't any different. There are going to be some legislative rules, some new statutes and some new regulations. And those are important parts of regulating any type of conduct. When it comes to enforcement litigation or just private civil litigation, the rules are the same. The question is how are they going to be applied? And the rules are strong and they're flexible and they've been applied to new technology over and over again for decades. But IoT is a little bit different for at least a couple of reasons. First of all, the technology is extremely complex. But also the relationships of the parties involved are a little bit different than most of the relationships in lawsuits up until now. The relationship between the user and the supply side is a little bit different. And the relationship of all of the different entities in the supply side ecosystem, there are so many of them, and what they do is so interconnected and interrelated, raises some really challenging complexities when it comes to IoT litigation. And what that means is that it's hard to predict how this litigation is going to play out. It's hard to understand what you should be doing if you're someone in the IoT space to try to protect yourself. And when I end up in a situation like that, if there's ambiguity or uncertainty, I like to go back to first principles. Because if you understand what the rules are designed to do and what they're supposed to accomplish, that's going to help you to understand and predict how they're going to be applied. And I actually think a really good place to start that discussion is with the question that Jeff Motz posed in introducing the keynote speech at last year's Black Hat. And he asked, what would make defense greater than offense? And that probably means different things to different people. But as a trial lawyer who focuses on IoT, I'm going to tell you what it means to me. What it means to me is that it's really hard to measure defense. And if it's hard to measure defense, that's not limited to cybersecurity. It's true in sports. It's true in all kinds of different contexts. But if it's hard to measure something, you're not going to be able to put a, an accurate value on it. And especially when it comes to IoT right now, when everybody's trying to get the latest and greatest gadget out to market as quickly as possible so that they can get that first mover advantage. And cybersecurity presents costs, both in terms of dollars and in terms of time. If you're not accurately valuing defense, chances are you're under-investing in it. And if you're under-investing in it, then almost by definition, your products or if you're contributing to an IoT product, your contribution is not going to reach the right level or type of cybersecurity. Now, everybody in the room probably just realized that what I just said has a whole bunch of issues packed into it. What is the right level of cybersecurity for an IoT product? And that's an amazingly complicated question. 
But whatever the answer is, if your product has a hack, or there's an important vulnerability that's exposed, and you get drawn into litigation, or the media focuses on it, they're going to be asking, what did you do? Why did this happen? Where did things go wrong? And you're going to want to make really sure that you're on the right side of the line when the person who needs to answer the question, which is likely to be a judge or a jury who doesn't know very much about cybersecurity, but when the question is put to them and they have to answer the question, what is the right level of cybersecurity for this particular product and did this organization meet it? You want to make sure that you're on the right side of that line with a margin for error because if you're not, not only are you going to get dragged into the litigation, but you can be held liable. So there's massive cost and significantly more risk than in most other situations. Now, as it happens, this is actually exactly the role that the legal system and lawsuits is supposed to play. In society, there are different laws and rules that are designed to regulate conduct. You've got statutes, you've got regulations, and you also have the court system. And right now, for IoT cybersecurity, I think that statutes and regulations are an important piece of the puzzle, but it's going to be really hard. I'm from Washington, D.C. I've been there ever since I graduated from law school, and it's not going to come as a surprise to anybody here. The city is completely dysfunctional. So relying on them to come up with the right statute in a highly technologically complex area where things are evolving so quickly is probably not the best idea. There are regulatory agencies that are focusing on it as well, but they kind of face the same issues, and there are issues of regulatory capture. And so what you wind up with is probably elevated importance for the legal system. And when there are lawsuits, there are a couple of primary considerations that drive, a couple of primary principles that drive the underlying purpose of those lawsuits in a civil context. So take as an example, I do something wrong and it injures you. Okay? You bring a lawsuit against me. And if you can show that I was at fault and that fault caused your injury, then the lawsuit, the, the, law, the legal system, wants me to pay for your injuries. So there are two components to that. One is compensation. You want to make sure that somebody who's innocent and was injured through no fault of their own doesn't have to bear those costs themselves. But the flip side of it, in determining accountability, it provides deterrence. Economists might call this sending the right signal or incentive or making sure that the right actors are internalizing their costs so that they are acting responsibly. And this is particularly true when it comes to product liability. The courts will try to identify the actor or the actors who are best situated to make sure that their products are safe. And if the products turn out not to be safe, then the rules in place are likely to impose liability almost regardless of fault, depending on the particular claim and depending on what happened. So all of this, again, gives us some insight into how IoT hacking and vulnerability litigation is likely to play out. Now, before I go any, before I go any further, I want to take a step back, talk about IoT products in general. There are lots of them. The estimates vary a lot, but you're up over 20 billion by 2020. These things are everywhere, and they're multiplying like rabbits. I want to talk about some of my favorite, most ridiculous IoT products. In, in third place, the bronze medalist, the smart IoT water bottle. This one glows when it wants you to drink. So I imagine that this is solving some innate human problem that we don't know what to do if we're thirsty. But luckily, we're all going to get saved by the glowy water bottle. Silver medalist, the IoT showerhead. So this one lets you turn on the water and set the temperature before you get into the shower. Now, I've never had too much trouble just reaching in and turning a little handle. But what I can tell you with certainty, that if I had one of these things in my house, as soon as I got into the shower, my 12-year-old and my 14-year-old would hack into my account and change my 90-degree shower into a 40-degree shower. And the gold medalist, easily. 
is the internet connected eye condom. This is real. And they market it as something that tracks statistics and performance of the user <laughs> and uploads it to the cloud so that he can compare his statistics to other people around the world. I'm not sure whether this is more disturbingly narcissistic or pathetically insecure, but I think most people can probably live without this, although I do see some intrigued faces in the audience right now, so maybe I'm wrong. All right, so why does that matter? Everybody likes fancy gadgets, right? Well, it matters because these things can cause harm, and to a certain extent, I really do believe people are underestimating it. And IoT products have certain characteristics that, if anything, make them more vulnerable than computer systems. They all have processors, they all have communication capacities. And as I pointed out earlier for various reasons, many of them tend to have limited cybersecurity. Cybersecurity may be an afterthought. Add to that that a lot of these products have different versions of code that are often proprietary. It makes detection of cyber attacks more difficult and patching more difficult. And then you have some particular user issues not only patch lag, but consumers in society are just starting to learn how to interact with IoT at all, let alone how to interact with it in a way that's safe from a cybersecurity perspective. And what that means is there are a lot of different ways that these products can cause harm. So we've got data breach. I said I wasn't going to focus on that, and I'm not going to, but obviously we don't want to forget about it. But you've got ransomware. You've got Consumer products like the ones that I just looked at that are begging to be strung together into botnets for DDoS attacks. You've got privacy related issues like the webcam hack from a few years ago that I'll mention again in a few minutes. And then you've got the big one, potential, potential for cyber physical impacts. And this is really important for a couple of reasons at least. One is that if there's a physical impact, either a personal injury or an injury to property, there's going to be a lawsuit. It's virtually guaranteed because there is a victim that can be trotted out in front of the jury. Relatedly, the legal rules when there is a physical injury to person or property are much more favorable to plaintiffs. And with the capability of IoT for having cyber physical impacts on a hack, when this happens, if you can get attribution there is absolutely going to be a lawsuit in virtually every instance. And we can think of some examples already of cyber physical impacts from IoT hacks. You've got the Dick Cheney example that was mentioned in the video. You've got Stuxnet, and there are some other interesting examples. I was at a presentation yesterday about industrial IoT. And then you have the one that's near and dear to my heart, the Jeep hack case, where obviously they managed to hack a Jeep in a way that they could control the brakes, the steering, and even the ignition. Okay, that's great. You're probably sitting there saying, this is no different than it's been for years. And we all know that plaintiff's lawyers are not exactly shy about bringing lawsuits if there's any possibility of success. So if there hasn't been a wave of lawsuits already, why does Polanski think there's going to be a wave of lawsuits going forward? And I'm going to answer that question. And the answer surrounds how plaintiff's lawyers think and what they take into account when they're making a decision about whether to take on a case. So, as the cartoon reflects, you've got your standard ambulance chasing plaintiff's lawyers. That's certainly true. But you also have some pretty good plaintiff's lawyers. They're smart, they're creative, and above all else, they tend to be really good business people. And their business is investing in lawsuits because plaintiff's lawyers often get paid through a contingency fee, which means they only get paid if they win. And so, obviously there are some factors that they're going to take into account when they're evaluating whether or not to take on a case. Some of those are obvious. They're going to want to know what the likelihood of success is. They're going to want to know how much they're going to win if they do succeed. But there are all of these factors that somewhat relate to the things I've already been talking about that have made conditions not right for IoT private 
civil lawsuits in most circumstances. First, there haven't been that many IoT hacks that are good candidates for lawsuits. To have a lawsuit, you need to have harm and you need to have attribution. So there have certainly been a lot of IoT hacks, there have been some big ones, but not necessarily ones that are good candidates for lawsuits. Relatedly, nobody understands this stuff. Plaintiff's lawyers don't, judges don't, juries don't. And if a plaintiff's lawyer doesn't understand the technology and doesn't quite know how the legal rules are going to apply, they don't have a playbook that increases the risk associated with taking on that case. And they're going to decline it more often than not. And related to that, there are a few precedents. Like I said, there really aren't any in this field. But all of these things are right on the verge of changing. I think people tend to agree that the cybersecurity, by and large, in IoT products is not where it needs to be. There are going to be more hacks. There are going to be widespread hacks. There are going to be hacks with cyber physical impacts. And those are absolutely going to lead to lawsuits. And as there are more lawsuits, plaintiff's lawyers will become more knowledgeable and more comfortable with this field. And as that happens, there will be more precedents. And you'll end up with a snowball effect that takes off very, very quickly. And this isn't just speculation on my part. Obviously, um, despite the fact that I'm primarily a defense attorney, I'm playing some role in this with the GPAC case. But I can tell you for a fact that this is what the plaintiff's bar, the group of plaintiff's lawyers in this country, have been talking about for years. They've been salivating over this. It's going to be a feeding frenzy. And they're right on the cusp of this all being triggered. There's one related set of issues I want to talk about. I term this interconnectedness. It may not be the type of interconnectedness you're thinking of, but the idea here is that the ecosystem on the supply side is so complex and interconnected that it creates a new type of risk for all of the defendants. So let me give you an example. Imagine a car is driving along, it hops a curb, and it hits a pedestrian. The pedestrian's hurt. He brings a lawsuit. Who does he sue? He sues the driver, sues the car manufacturer. Maybe the steering failed or the brakes failed, so he sues the manufacturer of that component. It's not straightforward, but it's not terribly complicated. Now imagine that that's a self-driving vehicle, or even just a connected vehicle. And there's a cybersecurity component. Something went wrong with the cybersecurity that helped to cause this accident. Same thing happens. Cars driving along, jumps a curb, hits a pedestrian. Who does the pedestrian sue now? He sues the driver, he sues the manufacturer, he sues the component manufacturer. He sues the people who designed the cybersecurity. He sues the people who did the code. He sued the people who have the sensors and the radar and the video cameras. He sues the component manufacturers and all of the people who contributed to that. They sue everybody in sight. This isn't unique to IoT. But because of the interconnectedness, it's much greater concern. Because what happens next? Let's assume you're working for a company that gets drawn into this litigation. What do you do? Well, first thing you do is you explain to the judge or the jury, no, 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 you don't understand. We did everything right. We are not to blame here. That's the obvious first step. But don't forget, you're in a courtroom. And just to the side of you is the plaintiff's table. And there's the plaintiff in a wheelchair in a full body cast. The judge and the jury are going to want to understand what went wrong. Why has this person been injured? This shouldn't have happened. They want an explanation. So the natural inclination is to say not only did we do everything right, that they're the ones who did something wrong, or these guys over here, they didn't take the proper level of care. That's fine, but you know what? These guys and those guys are running exactly the same calculus that you are. And they're going to start pointing their finger right back at you. So plaintiff's lawyer can sit back and let the defendants do his work for him as they point their fingers at each other and explain what everybody did wrong. This is another huge risk that's going to be associated with this wave of IoT liability and litigation. Who should care? Everybody. Anybody who contributes anything to an IoT product it gets hacked, or whether there's a significant vulnerability revealed, is going to be right in the sights of plaintiff's lawyers. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, you can get sued. 
And even if you didn't get anything wrong because the judges, the juries, the court system, and the lawyers aren't familiar enough with this area, you could be held liable if there's any question about whether you took the right level of care. Now, there has been some enforcement activity in some civil lawsuits. On the enforcement side, you've got a case from the FTC. This is the TrendNet webcam hack from 2012. You probably remember this. About 700 webcams were hacked, and video and some audio was uploaded to the internet. The FTC investigated and entered a consent decree, which is basically a settlement agreement in 2013. And the terms are relatively straightforward, some training, firmware updates, testing, that sort of thing. Nothing too onerous. This is really the FTC just dipping its toe in the water. And since then there hasn't been a lot. They've had some workshops and some hearings and that sort of thing. Certainly the FTC and the CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, are focused somewhat on this area. There hasn't been a lot of enforcement activity since this. But I'm going to explain to you how regulators think, just like how plaintiff's lawyers think. I live in Washington, D.C. I have for 20 years. And you may think that a regulatory agency is a monolithic, unitary entity that has you know, a, a mission statement and everyone follows it. But it's not. Just like any organization, it's made up of individuals. And those individuals may have their own ideas about what should be done. And some of those individuals may be very ambitious. They may want to get promoted. They may want to run for public office and get elected. And what's the best way to do that? It's to make a name for yourself. Now, how do you do that? Well, one way is to find the cases that hurt the most people or involve the most egregious conduct. They're going to go after those. But another way to do it is to find the cases that are in the headlines and say that you're the champion of this issue. And what issue is going to be in the headline more than IoT? I mean, the video shows that. People love this stuff. It's like Star Trek has come to life. But if anything goes wrong, the microscope that you're going to be put under is going to be intense. And disproportionately, there is going to be enforcement activity. Now, obviously, there are some limitations through statute on the scope of authority for regulatory agencies or state attorneys general. But make no mistake, they're looking for an excuse to start in this area. And then we have private litigation. We've got the GPAC case. So most of you are probably familiar with this. In 2015, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek did some amazing work showing how they could remotely hack a Jeep Grand Cherokee. And what they did is they used the Jeep's infotainment system as the attack surface. They penetrated it and were able to send or inject spoofed messages to the vehicle's CAN communication networks. And it allowed them to control critical operational and safety function of the Jeeps as they're being driven. Now you may know, well first of all, this got a lot of attention. Um, here's Lester Holt on the NBC Evening News talking about it as Charlie Miller drove Chris Valasek into a ditch remotely. You may know that this was reported in Wired Magazine in July 2015. And you may know that two days after that, Chrysler issued a recall. You may think that that's where things ended. For me and my team, that's where things began. In August of 2015, we filed a federal class action lawsuit against Chrysler and against Harman International, who is the manufacturer of the infotainment system that was used as the attack surface. And we alleged a number of claims based on our allegations that there were critical cybersecurity defects shared by all of these vehicles that render them unsafe. And as I mentioned, we just got class certification last month, and the petition for review, the appeal of that decision, was denied by the circuit court yesterday. So we're continuing. Three years later, and the litigation has been ugly, and it's been contentious, and it's been expensive, there have been hundreds of thousands of pages of documents produced in discovery. There have been all kinds of depositions taken. And we're still not even to the trial. These are the expenses of litigation even before you get to liability. 
Now, there's one other important thing that I should point out. I've mostly been talking about hacks, but you may mention or have noticed that I'm also talking about IoT vulnerabilities. In this case, no car was hacked in a way that caused a physical injury to person or property. The theory of damages is essentially a benefit of the bargain theory. And all that means is consumers thought they were buying a safe car, and what they got was a car that was riddled with cybersecurity defects that left these cars and trucks unsafe. That's our theory. And the measure of damages is the difference between the value of the safe car they thought they were buying and the unsafe car that they actually got. Now ask yourself, how much is that? That's going to be something that has to be determined at trial. But multiply that number by 220,000 vehicles, and that's our lawsuit right now. Let's talk about the costs. It's not just litigation. We're going to get back to that again in a second. You've got reputational harm. Like I said, if anything goes wrong, it's going to be splashed across the headlines. That's probably not good. You have a cost of remediation. You've got software updates, firmware updates, and when it comes to a physical product, there may even be manufacturing disruptions. Those are all costs. And you've got litigation. All right, so we talked about that. Everybody knows lawyers are expensive. That's why everybody hates us, one of many reasons. But it's more than that. These are really complicated cases, technologically and otherwise. You're going to need experts, hacking experts, damages experts, possibly other types of experts. They cost a lot of money. It's going to be a burden and a distraction on key employees. This goes unnoticed so often. But if something goes wrong, if there's a hack, if there's a vulnerability, if the evening news shows up in your corporate headquarters lobby and starts asking questions, you're going to want to know what happened. You're going to talk to your engineers, you're going to talk to your business people. And I'll tell you what, that's nothing compared to what the plaintiff's lawyers are going to want in discovery, which is a formalized process for exchanging information relevant to the dispute. They're going to want every document in sight. They're going to want emails, they're going to want memos, they're going to want analyses and spreadsheets. They're going to want to depose, to take depositions of your key employees. Your employees are going to be focused on the litigation instead of on doing their jobs. And I can't tell you the number of times I've sat across the table from an employee before a deposition or putting some of them up on the stand at a trial. These are people who love their job, they love their company, and it kills them to think that they may have done something or that they might say something that's going to harm the health of their organization. It causes incredible anxiety. This is the sort of thing that keeps people up at night. That's a real cost. And then we've got uncertainty and risk. This is a real cost too. Like I said before, you're going to have judges and juries who don't know much about cybersecurity making decisions that affect not only the health but potentially the viability of your organization. They're the ones who are going to decide what the right level of cybersecurity is for your IoT product. And they're going to decide whether you hit that level. And there are real costs associated with that. For example, Oftentimes, corporations keep reserves, so that if something goes bad with litigation, they've got money to pay it. And if it's hard to predict what the outcome is going to be, and it's hard to predict what the magnitude of any judgment is going to be, you're going to need to have larger reserves. And that's money that can't be put back into the business, reinvesting and growing it. Okay. Law school in 10 minutes. I'm not doing this to punish you. I'm doing this because you need to understand the rules and the standards that are going to be applied if you get drawn into litigation. And you need to understand them now, because the decisions that you make today and the decisions that you have been making are going to affect the outcome of any dispute that arises. And so what you have to do is understand the risks and understand the costs so that when you're making decisions about what the right level of cybersecurity to design into your product is, you're making it on an informed basis. Plus, it's actually only nine minutes, I timed it, and it's not going to be Socratic method like in law school, so I don't want to hear any complaints. All right, start with damages. Bottom line, any type of harm can be recoverable. 
physical injury, emotional distress, property damage, um, overpayment like in the GPAC case. All of it is on the table depending on the particular claim and the particular harm. Claims. All right, what is a claim? Claim is just a theory of recovery. These are the main ones in an IOT litigation. You have probably heard of most of them. Every claim has a set of requirements. They are called elements. In order for a plaintiff to recover, she has to prove every one of the elements of her claim. So We are going to go through them quickly. Um, before we do that, though, one important point to note, all of these claims are state law claims, not federal. And what that means is that there is no uniform law. The principles are the same or close to the same in all states, but the particular rules and requirements may vary from state to state, so be aware of that. Negligence, everybody kind of has a sense of what negligence is. Somebody doesn't exercise reasonable care. So there is that term again. That is the legal standard. Judge, I am the plaintiff. They didn't exercise reasonable care. The judge says, I don't know what that means. Give me experts. Give me testimony. He is going to decide what reasonable care is. Strict product liability. Design defect. So here is the Ford Pinto. Many of you are too young to remember this. Even I am by a little bit. Um, it had a gas tank that was placed right at the back, right behind the rear bumper. There was a nail or something that protruded, and so the slightest tap on the back bumper and the whole damn thing exploded. That's a design defect. It should not have been designed that way. Design defects can cover anything. It can cover hardware. It can cover software in certain situations. It can be things like inadequate segmentation or failure to use proper cybersecurity devices. Failure to properly design the way that passwords are handled. All of this can be the subject of a strict product liability claim. Now there has to be physical injury to person or property, and there has to be a defect. And here we're back to that standard of care idea again. It's different from negligence. And when I said at the beginning that if there's physical injury, the rules are really favorable to plaintiffs, this is what I'm talking about. To determine whether there's a defect, most states have one of two standards, or maybe even both. The product is dangerous beyond a consumer's expectations, or if it's unreasonably dangerous. Again, we've got experts in this room. I bet we could get ten people drawn at random in this room, and there is no way that they would agree what unreasonably dangerous is for a particular IoT device. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask a jury that knows nothing about cybersecurity to make that decision. Quickly, a few others. Breach of warranty. Everybody knows what a warranty is. There are implied warranties that you may not know about for consumer products. This is one of our claims in the Jeep hack case, where we allege that there is always an implied warranty of merchantability, which means that there is an assumption that products are safe and usable for their ordinary purposes. And Since we don't think that the cars are safe, we are bringing a claim for breach of the implied warranty of merchantability. You can have claims for fraud or fraudulent omission. Don't say things that aren't true. Fraudulent omission is when you know something that's material to another party and they're relying on you for that information, but you withhold it. So if you know or suspect that there's a cybersecurity issue with your IoT product and you're not telling anybody about it, there could be a claim for fraudulent omission. This is a big one. State consumer protection statutes. Plaintiffs love these. As the name suggests, they are designed to protect consumers, and they do a pretty good job of it for two basic reasons. One, the range of actionable conduct is very broad. It is anything that is unfair or deceptive. It varies from state to state, but that is the rule. And Then it is left to courts to decide what counts. So it can be something fraudulent, but it can be something short of that as well. In addition, the range of things that can be recovered is much broader. It's any actual harm, but there can also be statutory penalties, and there can be attorney's fees. And so attorneys love this because they'll bring a case, find a technical violation, hope to get some statutory penalties, and then they get paid for their work. So again, even if there's not a lot of harm, these statutes are often used by plaintiffs' lawyers and even state attorneys general's offices 
to bring claims. Okay, big question you're probably thinking about. Hey, I do what everybody else in the industry does. Will I even exceed that standard? Am I not in a safe place? And the answer is, that's good. If you don't meet the industry standard, that's bad. But it's not going to get you all the way home. Because ultimately the standards are going to ask whether, or the legal standards are going to require you to determine whether the technological standards are set at a reasonable level of safety. So you can't rely on this entirely. Okay, what should companies do? Well, do what you're doing, but do it on the basis of complete information. Hopefully I've helped you to understand why there's going to be a lot more litigation and what all of the costs and risks associated with that litigation are. So that when you're making your decisions in designing cybersecurity at all stages, you can either be informed immediately or at least you know what questions to ask your lawyers. Be paranoid. I don't mean design all cybersecurity that you possibly can, but think through all of the different ways your product could harm someone. And then allocate risk. You can do that in both directions on the supply chain. Okay, so if you're dealing with another business, maybe a supplier, you can have contractual provisions that dictate who's responsible if something goes wrong. It also works in the other direction. So even if you're a retailer, you can allocate some of the risk of harm to consumers through warnings and instructions. It may not get you all the way there, but if you've got a big honking warning that says, consumer, don't do this really dumb thing, and then they do that really dumb thing and get hurt, you're going to have a pretty good defense. Design review, pretty straightforward. Hazard analysis, risk assessment, look for potentially applicable standards, follow them. Test, obviously, but make sure that everything is memorialized. You want a process, a robust process for addressing cybersecurity issues, and you want to show what you've done, and you want to memorialize it contemporaneously with you taking the action. Ultimately, a judge, a jury, or the media and the public is going to want to know that you acted responsibly, and this is the way to do it. Word control programs. Okay, so for claims like fraud or warranty or consumer protection, a lot of that has to do with the words that surround the product. Be careful about the particular words, the substance of the words. Use instructions and manuals. Look at your advertisements very carefully. And ultimately, again, common sense, don't say dumb things, don't overrepresent, don't promise. Use insurance. This is tricky. Cybersecurity insurance is a big growth area for insurers, but they don't understand IoT litigation any better than anybody else. And so what they do is they load up these policies with all of these exclusions that make them eh, of questionable worth. So if you have a policy, take a look at it and see what the exclusions are. And if you don't have a policy, consider whether you can negotiate one that might provide you with some protection. Finally, what happens if something goes wrong? All right, you probably expected me to say this at some point. Hire a lawyer, not just any lawyer. Hire a lawyer who actually knows what they're doing in this area. It's complicated. Not only is it complicated, but you need to have somebody who can communicate these issues effectively to judges and juries. Investigate, um, talk to your engineers, talk to your business people, identify the scope, consider how to notify consumers, and act and respond responsibly. So takeaways, I think it's inevitable, and it's going to happen very, very soon. There is going to be a big wave of IoT um, hack and vulnerability litigation and enforcement activity. And if you're not prepared, if you're not taking steps now, and you don't know how to handle it, this could be an existential threat. Consider the scope of the GPAC case as I described it. That's the tip of the iceberg. Exercise sound cybersecurity principles, but consider all of the information. And if you don't have it, get it. Involve the lawyers a little bit more in the process. Nobody likes to deal with us, but sometimes it's necessary. And make sure that you have a clear process. Maybe you need a division or a person who's specifically responsible for cybersecurity. Make sure you've got all the right pieces. 
Make sure it's comprehensive, it's written, it's followed, and it's memorialized. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. And if you want, there are the sort of big glossy business cards at the back so you can grab one on your way out. I have a question. Um, I'm curious what you think about developers, engineers working on IoT security things and if you see a rise in those core cases as well. Uh, the question is whether there's gonna be cases against individual engineers or software developers working for companies. Um, the answer is no, you're probably just fine. Um, people don't, even if they could, and I'm not sure that they could, people don't go after the individual workers, they go after the company that has the deep pockets. Thank you. Uh, hi, great talk, thank you. Um, I have not seen any software component, IoT or otherwise, that does not have basically known vulnerabilities, so is it possible to actually, does that, the status quo is things have bugs, so can you, can you just go after that or do you need the harm or something else? So that's, that's a really good question. The question is, all software has bugs, so does that necessarily mean that it's actionable? And the answer is, it shouldn't. N nobody knows for sure because it hasn't played out, but if your best argument is that this has bugs and it's not unhackable, it's not gonna be a persuasive winning argument. So what a plaintiff's lawyer is gonna wanna try to do is show that there is an exceptional irresponsibility in this particular case. And that can play out in a number of ways when it comes to software, but it's not going to be just, you know, a relatively safe and responsible set of code. Thanks. You suggested that uh, in the event of an event, we go find a good lawyer. How would you suggest that we evaluate that? Well, so there are lots of good lawyers out there, but I think that this field really is different. Um, let me give you an example. After we got class certification in the Jeep case, a pretty reputable law firm came out with you know, a, a, a note, a memo to clients saying this is really important. And they said, this is a really important data breach case. It's not a data breach case. Totally different set of rules. So obviously you shouldn't hire that firm for IoT, and frankly you probably shouldn't hire that firm for data breach either. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, you really, you want to find somebody who understands the technology. It's not necessarily an engineer, though. It's somebody who can communicate about it, and ideally somebody who has some experience. There aren't a lot of lawyers like that, but that's what you're going to be looking for. So I have a question. We, we just re recently uh, released some security research about inexpensive device, IoT cameras, and the company that makes them is based in the East, so a different country. So if it's only a $50 camera in the first place, what's the chance that like a U.S. citizen could sue that company and recover $10 or something? Well, okay, so there's a whole lot of questions wrapped up in that. The question is, what if it's a foreign corporation and it's a, a relatively inexpensive consumer device? And the answer is, if they're doing business here and the harm is caused here, then they've submitted themselves to the jurisdiction of the courts. You're not gonna bring a lawsuit for $10, but that's exactly what the class action mechanism is for, is to aggregate a whole bunch of claims of people who have been harmed in the same way. I think maybe you have time for one last question. IoT isn't new, uh, it's just a new kind of a buzzword. So my company has a lot of legacy systems that we've been doing essentially IoT for 20 years. How do you handle legacy systems in these ways that, um, you know, there's, you either need to replace them or update them? And I mean, the way to think about this is to say, what if something goes wrong? What, what are people gonna ask? What are they gonna wanna know? And are they gonna accept as an excuse, well, we did this 20 years ago and we didn't change it? The answer is no. Um, they're gonna to wanna to see that you're looking and you're evaluating and you're updating in a responsible way. So if they continue to use that product, sorry, it's called, uh, if they continue to use that product, is that then the, and you've, you've issued a statement, is it then the consumer's problem and not your problem? Um, so the question now is, what if you issue a warning to consumers? And the answer is, you want the warning to be as clear and as prominent as possible. It's certainly going to help. Whether it gets you all the way home is gonna depend on the specific facts. So thanks everybody.